Welcome everybody and hello from Princeton, New Jersey and environs. And this is the monthly meeting of the Amateur Astronomers Association of Princeton. And we're thrilled to be here with you tonight and hoping that you really have an enjoyable experience as we hear a, an unusual talk by an outstanding speaker. That will be coming up shortly. I just have a couple of announcements I want to go through, and we're actually waiting for our speaker to link into our Zoom session. Don't need so, to Victor, wait because I'm already linked. Well, he is here. Well, hello, welcome, Dr. Loeb. Great to have you. Thank you. And I just need you to allow me to share my screen because otherwise I won't be able to give the talk. Yeah, you'll you'll be able to do that. Dr. Very yeah. good. So um, if, if you don't mind holding on for one second as the guys get our screen sharing going with you. As much as you gonna... need. I, I'm, I'm willing to be silent and you just speak the entire hour. That would be fine. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you don't mind sitting around for two minutes, let me go through a couple okay. of announcements that I need to inform the members of. Is that all right? That, yeah, perfectly fine. And I'll tell you, I mean, it's a pleasure personally to have you here tonight in all of the club. I, I speak for the Princeton Club and, and maybe some guests that we have from the area on tonight. But I'm actually uh, interested in a number of angles. And one is that I actually have the, the joy of traveling to Israel coming up in December. And I'm very much looking forward for my first trip to the nation of Israel. So that's a little side comment from me. But um, I want to tell all of you on the meeting tonight that this is, in fact, formally our last Zoom monthly meeting. It's been two and a half years now since we've going, been going this route, and it's been, it's been a very interesting experience, but obviously we've been anxious to get back to real time and space. And so we do have this opportunity to get back to real time and space. We're coming back to Peyton Hall, the home of the Astrophysical Sciences Department at Princeton next month, November 11th. And there'll be much to be said about this. Uh, we can talk about how we're gonna be handling parking and how things are going to be a little bit different. But just a quick um, aside for you all, plan on arriving early. We'll publish this map inside Aerial Times next month. You'll have ample opportunity to figure out what's what. But basically, Peyton Hall of Astrophysics in the upper left there, the parking area across the Ivy Lane, which for years and years has been our parking lots, is now one mammoth construction site. An incredible amount of building is going on, part of the big master plan of Princeton University. So consequently, uh, uh, the, the uh, Folks at Peyton Hall are welcoming us back, but we are warned that we must park over here in the lower right where it says East Garage under construction. In fact, that construction has been completed and you'll be asked to park there and walk along the red dotted line. And you can't really miss it because Peyton Hall is right across from the corner of the the football stadium. There's something about um, astronomy departments being located next to, to uh, football stadiums and campuses <laughs> across the country. But, um, we're going to come back after the intermission to talk about astronomy by and for the members. We're in the midst of our Lunar South Pole Challenge in the wake of the uh, Artemis project and the help for launch of the Artemis One. We become very interested in this concept of ice on the moon. And I've challenged members to try to observe an image the very region of craters around the South Pole. We'll come back to that. It's kind of a, a project that we're immersed in. I want to show you some results and talk about it a little bit more after the intermission. So I think since Dr. Love has joined us here, I want to turn it over to our, uh, our um, program chairman, Victor Davis, and he's going to do the intro for the night's main talk. On October uh, 19th, 2017, astronomers using the University of Hawaii's Pan Stars One telescope discovered a highly unusual object. Its speed and trajectory indicated that it originated outside our solar system. Its elongated shape gave it an aspect ratio greater than that of any asteroid or comet observed to date. While there was a lot that was odd about the object, uh, it was called 11 2017 U1, it was soon named Umuamua. Hawaiian for a messenger from afar arriving first. Most astronomers agreed that Oumuamua was unique and a fascinating object, uh, but our guest speaker tonight, uh, Professor Avi Loeb, went further 
He suggested that Oumuamua could be a technological artifact of an alien civilization, cruising through our solar system much as our own Voyager space probes are leaving it. Professor Loeb gained notoriety and provoked no small amount of controversy when he argued in his book, Extraterrestrial, that Oumuamua could be a techno-signature of alien life. Um, a few words about our speaker tonight. Uh, Professor Loeb is the head of the Galileo Project, founding director of Harvard University's Black Hole Initiative, um, director of the Institute for Theory and Computation at the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics, and the former chair of the astronomy department at Harvard University from 2011 to 2020. He chairs the advisory board for the Breakthrough Starshot Project and is a former member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology and a former chair of the Board on Physics and Astronomy of the National Academies. He's the best-selling author of Extraterrestrial, The First Sign of Intelligent Life Beyond Earth, and a co-author of the textbook, Life in the Cosmos, both published in 2021. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, just uh, at the start, let me mention that I spent six years at Princeton. The first five were at the Institute for Advanced Study at the beginning of my career when I didn't know how the sun shines. <laughs> and uh, my mentor was John Bacall, who focused decades on studies of the sun. That shows more, uh, that reflects more uh, on him than uh, on me, um, that he was, he was willing to take a risk. Um, and the, the reason it, it is paying off, I mean, uh, this is the message, an email that I just got, uh, as you can tell, 34 minutes ago. Okay, so 7.02 p.m. today. This is the message, you see it here. So apparently some people think that, uh, you know, the, what we are doing with the Galileo project is very exciting. Um, let me show a video that was actually featured last month uh, on um, NBC uh, Boston. Uh, and it will just take a couple of minutes, uh, a few minutes and I'll, um, then continue. My name is Avi Lo, Professor of Science at Harvard University. In the coming months, I'm going to lead an expedition to Papua New Guinea to scoop the ocean floor and search for fragments of the first interstellar meteor. Although Avi is in search of what he believes may be alien technology, proof of extraterrestrial existence has never been what's driven his life's work until now. I'm hopeful we would find something. The question is, what is it? An unusual rock, a natural object, or artificial? Despite being the longest serving chair of Harvard University's Department of Astronomy, it wasn't until recently that he started to investigate the possibility that there is life beyond our solar system. I found the catalog that the government compiled of meteors that were detected by government sensors that are missile warning system. I asked my students to check if any of the meteors, the fastest moving meteors, could have arrived to Earth from outside the solar system. There was one in particular that sparked the interest of Lowe and his students, Amir Siraj. We decided to write a paper about this meteor, which was discovered on January 8, 2014. Light from the exploding was seen by government sensors, despite the government releasing limited data. He had discovered something groundbreaking. His paper laid out what he believed to be true. But three years after writing his findings, a major development confirmed what he knew all along. After a few years, the release of a letter from the US Space Command in the Department of Defense stating explicitly that this meteor at the 99.999% confidence level came from outside the solar system. Based on the speed of the meteor and how much of the object burned upon entry, Avi determined that it must be made of a material that is tougher than iron. And so this one was an outlier in terms of its composition. It was also an outlier in terms of its speed outside the solar system. It moved at least twice as fast as power to move relative to the sun in the vicinity of the sun. Armed with new evidence validating his findings, Avi decided to take action and make moves to recover the object his next hurdle. Funded through private donations, 
he has secured a portion of the money to take the trip. Let's continue to look for objects like it. It was obvious to us that we need to go there and collect the fragments because to do the same thing for an object in space would cost more than a billion dollars. For a cost that is a thousand times lower, we can go to the ocean floor and collect material from an interstellar object. Now, Avi has the task of finding an object that most likely fractured on impact, leaving fragments possibly the size of pennies lost at the bottom of the ocean. It's a challenge that might seem insurmountable in the vast existence of the Pacific Ocean. But Avi is confident they will recover what they are in search of. It's a fishing expedition, literally speaking, and what we can do is basically take the trajectory of this meteor and extrapolate it all the way to the ocean surface. Now, of course, when the explosion took place, there were fragments generated and they were scattered over a region. One imagines that the tiny pellets would be carried farther away from the point of impact, whereas the heavier fragments will sink down closer to the impact. Finding a big chunk can inform us much more about the structure of the original function. We're planning to board the ship and build a sled and the magnet attached to it that will scoop the ocean floor and we will go back and forth like mowing the lawns across the region, 10 kilometers in size, and collect with the magnet all the fragments that are attracted to it and then brush them off and study their composition in the laboratory. This would be the first time that humans put their hands on the material that makes an object that came from another star. With more advanced technology in our sky, than in any other point in history, new findings are becoming far more frequent and impossible to ignore. Thanks to a government report that was released last year, the possibility of extraterrestrial life and the pursuit of proof of its existence is finally losing its stigma. The stigma has been reduced. Would be the most important scientific discovery that humanity ever made because if you think about it, we change our perspective about our place in the universe. With science in this corner, this professor is not intimidated by critics. It's not a philosophical question whether we live in an environment where objects are floating around that are representing extraterrestrial technologies. We just need to use our telescopes and find out. In fact, we are not even the first to say that. Galileo Galilei said that four centuries ago, and he was put in house arrest. Today, he would have been canceled on social media. Once I realized that we found an object from a technological origin that was produced elsewhere, I would not seek approval from anyone else. I don't need likes on Twitter. I just want to know what it is. Okay, so that was a brief um, uh, summary of this uh, mission that we are uh, planning to have. And let me now... <clears throat> Uh, get to my the, the main focus of the presentation, which relates to my book, uh, Extraterrestrial. You can see the cover in the middle. And if I had the, to summarize it in one sentence, I would say, uh, when you're not ready to find exceptional things, you will never discover them. Uh, and what you see on the left side um, is a photograph uh, of a picture that was hung uh, on the walls of the Berlin Brandenburg uh, Academy of Science and Humanities. It was taken by a German photographer. In fact, right now it's at MIT. I saw it last week uh, over there. And the photographer came and asked me to write on the palm of my hand the question that I regard as most important in science. And I wrote, are we alone? This is um, actually an essay that I wrote this morning. Uh, so if any of you is interested, uh, it appeared in Medium. Uh, you can just search for this uh, title, A Word of Torah About Extraterrestrials. And the reason I, I wrote this essay this morning, I woke up at 3.30 uh, a.m. before my morning jog. Um, and the, the reason I wrote it is what you see on the right-hand side of this slide. Uh, there was apparently uh, a sermon given uh, a week ago uh, for the Jewish uh, holiday of Yom Kippur uh, by a rabbi, uh, Elisa Joy uh, Aus 
Auster Klein, and she referred to my book, Extraterrestrial, which was a surprise to me. So the entire sermon was basically focused on my book, and uh, there is a close relationship between spirituality and the frontiers of science, because both of them explore the unknown. So if you're interested in more details, um, check it out uh, on Medium. It appeared this morning. This is the group of uh, members of the Galileo Project, uh, and I'll describe what uh, it entails uh, in a few minutes. Uh, this project was established a year ago after a few multi-billionaires came to the porch of my home in Lexington, Massachusetts, and uh, offered me a few million dollars to my research account at Harvard, and uh, I established this project a month later. And uh, we just had uh, in uh, August the first uh, meeting of the Galileo project, uh, uh, in-person meeting. It's such a great privilege and pleasure to see 70 members of the Galileo Project team coming together, celebrating the past year accomplishments of the project. And uh, we are just at the beginning uh, because in the coming year, we hope to collect data and find out what it shows. Uh, we make no assumptions, we're completely agnostic, but it's, it's like the government is telling us that there are some exciting objects out there that we need to figure out what they are. And that's our fault. So let me move on and I'll describe um, uh, the project in a few minutes, but let me start first um, with the, the broad perspective. And I think it's a matter of cosmic modesty. I mean, that's the biggest message that we received from studying the universe so far. We are not at the center of the stage, like people thought during uh, uh, for a thousand years after uh, Aristotle stated that. Um, and uh, moreover, the universe existed for 13.8 billion years before we came to the scene. So, you know, the cosmic play is not about us. Okay, when you are not at the center of the stage and you just arrive at the end, it's not about you. And that, that is a, a message that we refuse to take throughout history. And, and now we're holding on to the remaining aspect of us being unique and special, which is sentience. Uh, we believe that we are the only sentient beings, but I don't think so. Uh, and we'll get to that. We now know that half of the sun-like stars host an Earth-like planet in their habitable zone. Uh, the number half is plus or minus 30%. Uh, there is a large uncertainty in it, but it's clear that it's a substantial fraction uh, of all stars and, and we are not special or unique. We, we are not privileged. Um, there are more habitable Earths in the observable volume of the universe than grains of sand on all beaches on earth. So uh, when you see an emperor or a king being very proud of themselves, um, after conquering a small piece of land here on Earth, you shouldn't be impressed because they are no different than an ant hugging a single grain of sand on the landscape of a huge beach. And uh, I can sort of understand where it's coming from, this arrogance, uh, because when my daughters were young, uh, they thought that the world centers on them because that was their immediate environment. And then... Um, uh, they compare themselves to the family member. That's all they knew about. And of course, they had a psychological shock on the first day to the kindergarten. They realized that there is a smarter kid on their block. And um, our civilization will mature by meeting others. And my point is that Albert Einstein, even though uh, you have special pride, um, <clears throat> Uh, for uh, about him, uh, given that he spent uh, the last uh, phase of his career at Princeton, I don't think he was necessarily the smartest scientist who ever lived since the Big Bang 13.8 billion years ago. There must have been other scientists on exoplanets around other stars that were smarter than Einstein. Perhaps they also lived in exo Princeton, New Jersey, but that doesn't change the fact that uh, it's very likely that 
a billion years ago, uh, another civilization could have sent probes uh, that would have reached our vicinity by now. And uh, you know whether we uh, live in that reality or not is not a philosophical question. We can just look and check. And we know that most stars form billions of years before the sun, and therefore the clock of intelligent civilizations may have started earlier than here. So searching for radio signals makes very little sense. For that, you, have, you need them to be at exactly the same technological phase as we are right now. You need them to use radio communication. But if they are a billion years older than than us, why would they do that? And just think about all of our science and technology being developed over one century. And the, much of the technology is evolving exponentially on a few years time scale. So just it's unimaginable at what phase they would be right now um, if it's a billion years into our future. And so, you know, why should they send radio signals to indicate to everyone else that they exist out there? They have other ambitions. And most likely they sent out equipment that has artificial intelligence and um, doesn't need to wait for guidance from the senders uh, because even light takes tens of thousands of years to travel across the Milky Way galaxy. That's a long time. And so interstellar systems have to be autonomous and have uh, artificial intelligence. And within a billion years, even with chemical propulsion, they can populate all the habitable regions around stars within the Milky Way galaxy. Uh, it takes less than, less than half a billion years to do that and propagate throughout the Milky Way galaxy. And if they're self-replicating, then their number can grow exponentially. The only way to find out is to look around and see whether there are any probes in our vicinity. And that was not done. We shouldn't repeat the mistake of philosophers during the days of Galileo that refused to look through his telescope. So the first report, as mentioned in, in my introduction, uh, the first report about uh, an interstellar object was uh, Oumuamua from a telescope in Hawaii called PanStars. Uh, this telescope was uh, is a survey telescope and it was constructed following uh, the task that uh, the US Congress gave NASA back in 2005, uh, asking NASA to identify 90% of all the objects bigger than a football field, bigger than 140 meters, because we know what happened to the dinosaurs. Um, they were um, eliminated by a rock the size of Manhattan Island and we don't want it to happen to us. But um, it, it takes a while to find all the objects bigger than a football field. That's a much smaller scale than uh, Manhattan Island. So um, at any event, uh, Pan Stars was constructed for that purpose. And one of the objects that they saw through Earth, uh, I mean, they saw close to Earth, uh, a near Earth object, they flagged it, and then they noticed this object is actually moving very fast, uh, faster than the escape speed from the solar system. So it must be unbound to the sun and came from interstellar space. And they gave it the name Oumuamua, which in the Hawaiian language means scout. That was the first report back in October 19th, 2017. But it wasn't the first object that humans identified from outside the solar system. Almost four years earlier, uh, the first interstellar meteor was recorded in uh, US government data, uh, basically a missile warning system that identified this meteor as it burned up in the atmosphere and created a fireball. And uh, the data indicated the object was moving at 45 kilometers per second when it was about 18 kilometers above the ocean surface, uh, 100 miles off the coast of Papua New Guinea, the object was about half a meter in size based on the amount of energy released, a few percent of the energy of the Hiroshima atomic bomb. And we argued based on its very high speed that it came from interstellar space. And it was actually the first object four years before Oumuamua. 
but my colleagues in the astronomy community, uh, or specifically the reviewer of uh, the reviewers of our paper, uh, rejected it. They said we don't believe the U.S. government. So it took three years to get this letter that you see on the left that was sent from the U.S. Space Command under the Department of Defense to NASA, confirming at the 99.999% confidence that indeed this object came from outside the solar system, as we argued with my student in 2019. So by now, after this letter appeared, our paper was accepted for publication. And the government also released the light curve from this explosion of the meteor. And by analyzing it, we could tell that it was made of a material tougher than iron because it only disintegrated in the lower atmosphere of the Earth. So its yield strength was a few times larger than that of iron. And iron meteorites make only 5% of all the space rocks that we see from the solar system. So clearly, this object was unusual. Why would the first interstellar meteor be so unusual? And just a few weeks ago, we looked again at the data and found a second interstellar meteor. Uh, and when we plot the distribution of meteors on the left, as a function of material strength or yield strength, we find that these two interstellar meteors are really the toughest among 273 space rocks that the government recorded. So there is only one part in 10,000 chance that they were drawn from the same distribution of material strengths that solar system rocks are drawn from. And that means that interstellar meteors originate from a source that is different than planetary systems like the solar system. What is this source? We don't know. The most important question is, are those meteors artificial in origin? Are they spacecraft that were designed to be tougher than iron and were designed to move faster than the nearby stars? And to find out if they are natural or artificial, we plan this uh, expedition to uh, the, near the coast of Papua New Guinea uh, with a boat, and we are currently planning it. And then um, just uh, last month, I received one and a half million dollars that funds to fund the entire expedition. Uh, once again, I didn't do any fundraising. I just announced this expedition, and I had a Zoom call with a person who donated. A million dollars, another one gave me half a million and we're done. What you heard in the background was uh, the sound of the universe knocking on our door. Mm -hmm. It was the seismometer signal recorded on Manus Island in, in Papua New Guinea converted to sound from the impact of this first interstellar meteor. And the answer to Fermi's paradox, where is everybody? is check the front door. So we are planning this search and uh, hopefully we will do it within the coming half a year. We're currently in the detailed planning stages. But let me come back to the third interstellar uh, object that was discovered, Oumuamua. So we had two meteors and then Oumuamua. Uh, the first two were, were discovered by my student, Amir Siraj, and myself. Uh, this one was discovered by the telescope in Hawaii, and it didn't collide with the Earth. That's why it was much bigger than the meteors, about the size of a football field, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to detect it. Uh, smaller objects do not reflect enough sunlight. So there might be a million uh, objects the size of a meter for every Oumuamua-like object. That's our estimate. And the one strange thing about the initial state of Oumuamua was that it was in the so-called local standard of rest, which is the frame of reference that you get to when you average over all the motions of all the stars in the vicinity of the sun. This is called the local standard of rest. And Oumuamua was at rest in that frame. Only one in 500 stars 
is so much at rest in the local standard of rest as Oumuamua was. And then it came close to the sun. So the way to think of it is like a buoy sitting at rest uh, on the surface of the ocean and the solar system, like a giant ship, bumped into it and gave it a kick through the gravitational force of the sun. And as the object was tumbling every eight hours, the amount of sunlight that was reflected from it changed by a factor of 10, which is very extreme. All the space rocks that usually uh, are members of the solar system, they have a variation by at most a factor of three. So a factor of 10 variation means that the area of this object projected on the sky changed by a factor of 10 as it was tumbling. Just think about a piece of paper tumbling in the wind. Yeah, there is a very small likelihood that it will be exactly edge on. So a factor of 10 change in area is a lot. And in fact, the best fit to the variation of sunlight was that of a flat object, pancake shaped, which is again, unusual. At the 90% confidence, this is a paper just written about the likelihood and uh, arguing that it was most likely flat, disc-like. It's even in the title of this paper. And then the there was a Nature paper, a paper that appeared in the mag in Nature magazine, a uh, very prestigious uh, journal, that stated that um, the object exhibited an excess push away from the sun. So usually you see such a push uh, if you're dealing with a comet. And some of my colleagues still call it a comet, but it didn't look like a comet. You can see on the right-hand side a, 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 an image from the Spitzer Space Telescope with very deep observations of this object, or Muamua, the paper appears here in, in the bottom. Uh, and then the, this image just shows noise. There is no dust, no carbon-based molecules that the Spitzer Space Telescope noticed. It was definitely not a comet. A comet you can see easily as a result of its uh, reflection of sunlight. But even if you forget about it, you know you can just see directly the dust or, or carbon-based molecules. Here, nothing, nothing was seen around this object, no evaporation. So what gave it this acceleration, non-gravitational acceleration? And the repulsive force was consistent with a dependence on inverse uh, with distance squared from the sun. So the only way I could think of uh, explaining this is if the force is a result of the reflection of sunlight from the object or absorption of sunlight. In both cases, it would be inversely with distance squared. But for that to be effective, the object had to be very thin sort of like a sail. And nature doesn't make such objects, so I suggested maybe it's artificial. So there were all these unusual properties of Oumuamua anomalies that made it not a comet, definitely not a comet, and not a, an asteroid of the type that we are familiar with, because an asteroid that is just pure rock that doesn't evaporate would not get pushed away from the sun. So. What did mainstream astronomers suggest? They agreed that this object is a very unusual object. And they said, oh, maybe it's a dust bunny. Just think about what you find at home on the, on the carpet, you know, the dust bunny, except this one needs to be a hundred times less dense than air. A hundred times less dense than air so that it will be pushed by reflecting sunlight. But such a rarefied uh, object would not maintain its in integrity when it comes close to the sun and gets heated by hundreds of degrees. So then another team came up with a different suggestion. They said, well, maybe it's a chunk of frozen hydrogen so that when the hydrogen evaporates, we don't see it because hydrogen is transparent. The only problem is that it won't survive the journey through interstellar space because hydrogen evaporates very quickly. So the authors of this paper agree. Yes, it wouldn't survive the journey. So then another team came up with the 
proposal, maybe it's a nitrogen iceberg chipped off the surface of a planet like Pluto. The problem with that is there is not enough material to make enough chips uh, so that you will get a population of nitrogen icebergs that explains the detection of Oumuamua. And uh, <clears throat> you miss it by a very large margin, orders of magnitude. So there is just not enough solid nitrogen. And by the way, we have never seen a dust bunny. We have never seen a, a hydrogen iceberg, nor a nitrogen iceberg. These are all objects that we've never seen before. So the fundamental question is, was the Muamua natural or artificial in origin? And the way I think of this is that uh, while walking on the beach, you see most of the time rocks or seashells that were naturally produced, but every now and then you see a plastic bottle. So perhaps a Muamua was a plastic bottle. And surprisingly, three years later, after the discovery of Oumuamua, the same telescope in Hawaii discovered another object which showed a push away from the sun as a result of radiation pressure, no cometary tail, but then they realized it's made of stainless steel. They could figure out the composition and they realized it's actually a rocket booster that NASA launched in 1966 to the moon as part of a mission to the moon. So we know that it's artificial, this uh, 2020 SO, the object, there is a Wikipedia page, you can read about it. We know that it's artificial, it had thin walls made of stain stainless steel and reflected sunlight and was pushed as a result of having a large area for its mass. The question is, who produced Oumuamua? And if I imagine a cave dweller used to playing with rocks and finding a cell phone, the cave dweller would immediately say, oh, this is a rock that is very shiny of a type that I've never seen before. And of course, if he is curious enough and not, will not throw it away and move on, then he would realize that by pressing a button, he can record his voice. Pressing another button, he can record his image. It's not really a rock. But if he doesn't entertain a possibility other than a rock of a type that he had never seen before. He might throw it away and move on. I wrote the, the book Exoterrestrial about Oumuamua and the, to my surprise, there was a new, uh, there was a winery in Santa Cruz that is quite uh, well known called the Bonnie Dune Vineyard uh, that they made a special wine inspired by my book. And uh, we actually ordered it for the conference of the Galileo Project uh, a couple of months ago. And here is another place where the book was mentioned. Here's your clue. I look at the world and I notice it's turning. Thanks to this man who studied at the University of Krakow in the 1490s. Who is Brian? No, correct response. Who is Nicholas Copernicus? You lose a little bit. Pick again, Robin. Scientist for 600. We think of this Russian who became a professor of general chemistry in 1867 periodically. Robin. Who is Mendeleev? Yes. Scientist 300. Avi Loeb thinks a space object seen in 2017 and artistically depicted here comes from this 16-letter type of being, the title of his book. Kevin. What is actually terrestrial? Correct. Uh, scientist for a thousand. Okay, um, let's move on. Um, <laughs> there was another sermon uh, actually a year ago. Um, 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 but I will not get into the details. Let's move on. 
So um, altogether, it's a new frontier uh, in astronomy. Uh, the first three interstellar objects that were discovered appear to be unusual. So we need more data. And uh, obviously, in answer to Fer Fermi's paradox, where is everybody? You know, to find your neighbors, you can't just sit at home and say, I don't see anyone next to me. You need to look through your windows and you better use a telescope. So the government says, there was a, a report from the director of national intelligence, Avril Haines, uh, which talks about objects that the government cannot identify. And I actually uh, attended a forum in Washington DC last November and they asked Avril Haines, she was with me in the green room. Uh, it was an, a forum with Jeff Bezos and Bill Nelson, the head of NASA. And I asked Avril, you know, what, what do you think these objects are that you, in your report, you, you have a bachelor's degree in uh, theoretical physics. And she said, I don't know. So it's our duty as scientists to figure out what these unidentified objects are because the government doesn't know the public cares a lot about it. And the Congress uh, established a new office um, in government that looks into the identity or all the, collects all the data from all branches of government. And actually the director of this new office visited my home last week. We had a very interesting conversation. So, the astronomical search for interstellar objects has only begun. And just keep in mind that astronomers, if there was an object moving very fast, and by very fast, I mean at a speed much larger than 30 kilometers per second, the characteristic speed of uh, objects in the vicinity of Earth and uh, near the sun. Uh, if an object moved, the, the, by the way, this speed is just a percent of a percent of the speed of light, 10 to the minus four of the speed of light. If there was an object moving at the speed that is 10 times bigger, astronomers would just ignore it because they look for objects that come from the solar system most of the time. And um, it's our duty to look for faster objects now and check maybe there is something unusual. So the coming years will be exciting. And um, the Galileo project um, that I mentioned will look for objects in, in different ways. Uh, and just keep in mind that uh, the search for interstellar objects has nothing to do with the Drake equation. The Drake equation is for radio signals. You're asking how many transmitters are transmitting just when we are looking out so that we can see them. That's the Drake equation. But uh, that has nothing to do with objects because radio signals, if they were sent a billion years ago, they are now a billion light years away. So we can't see them. But if uh, objects that were propelled by chemical fuel were sent a billion years ago, they move at a speed that is much less than the escape speed from the Milky Way galaxy. So they are captured in the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way is just like a basket collecting all the objects, all the artificial objects generated and propelled by chemical fuel over the past 10 billion years. Nothing escapes. So the number of objects you find in a survey would be the average number of objects per unit volume times the survey volume. As you can tell, this equation has nothing to do with the Drake equation, very different, because the number is accumulating over time. And then if you consider the Earth uh, as a fishing net that collects objects as it moves around the sun, then what you care about is the flux of objects, which is the number per unit volume times their speed. That would constitute interstellar meteors. Now, obviously, we looked at the objects above a certain size and below a certain speed. So there is a lot of room here uh, to find new objects, but we would find new objects only if we look. There is another factor, which is one minus what I call the ostrich factor, <laughs> uh, which is the chance that we will bury our head in the sand and say, oh, everything out there is rocks. 
It may be rocks of a type that we've never seen before, but it's still rocks, forget about it, let's move on. Which is pretty much what the vast majority of the astronomers would say now. And I just don't understand why they would say that if they agree that the, the most likely explanation is a rock of a type that we've never seen before. Uh, they can't say that with confidence that it's natural. So why would they be so confident that it's natural if it's something that we've never seen before? And we currently have a rover on the surface of Mars. It's called Perseverance. Uh, and of course, if it finds microbes on early uh, that indicate that there was life on early Mars, and nobody would feel offended. People would get excited because there is no threat to human intelligence. We can still feel superior relative to those microbes. We are smart. They are not. But just imagine the same rover bumping into the wreckage of an advanced spaceship that we did not produce, that represents technologies far more advanced than we have. That would be a blow to our ego. And many people don't like that possibility. So with respect to the Galileo project, one uh, mission would be to take a close-up photograph of the next Oumuamua. I call it dating the next Oumuamua, which I mean, Osiris Rex did it with uh, the asteroid Bennu, as you can see on the right side, and there will be a sample return to Earth next year. Um, and we actually have a dating app. Uh, it's called the Vera Rubin Observatory. And it will have a survey uh, with a 3.2 billion pixel camera. So when you look at your cell phone, you have a few million pixel camera in the cell phone. Here I'm talking about a thousand times more pixels. There was never a camera like that. 3.2 billion pixels. And it will survey the southern sky every four days and the entire southern sky. So this is a dating app because it could identify objects like Oumuamua every few months. And most of the time, we will swipe to the left. But every now and then, we might decide to send a, a, a camera close to one of these objects that looks as weird as Oumuamua is or was. The other thing we can do with the next Oumuamua is use the Webb telescope to look at it from a different direction. The Webb telescope is a million miles away from Earth a million miles away from Earth, meaning that if an object comes close to Earth, like Oumuamua did, then we can look at it from different directions. We will get the three-dimensional trajectory from the parallax using observatories on Earth and the Webb telescope. So that would allow us to infer uh, with exquisite precision, precision uh, any non-gravitational motion by the object. Uh, one possibility is that Oumuamua was thin and flat because it was a leaflet carrying a message. And that would be tragic uh, because uh, it's just like missing a love letter uh, and finding it, find, realizing it only after the person to whom the, the love letter was addressed uh, is not around anymore. If we destroy our, our climate or perish in a war and, and this you know, leaflet uh, carried the message for us, that would be really tragic. But it could also be uh, something else. And um, what I would like to emphasize is that the only monuments that are worthwhile are in space. And you know, when I go to Harvard Yard, I see uh, statues or paintings that uh, tried to um, sort of uh, replicate the physical appearance of important people, uh, former deans or presidents of Harvard University. And that makes very little sense because within a billion years, the sun will burn up, all of them. Uh, it will boil off the oceans on Earth. 
if you want to maintain a memory of yourself uh, beyond a billion years from now, the best thing to do is to send an AI astronaut, something that represents your, not just your physical appearance, but your intellectual uh, DNA. So uh, not just a, 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 your physical image, but something that can um, follow the uh, guiding principles that you equip it with. And I, I would be very proud of any technological kids that will carry our guiding principles into the universe. There is, I should say, the, um, there is the New Horizons spacecraft that uh, went to explore Pluto and it carried 30 grams of the ashes of the discoverer of Pluto, Clyde Tombaugh. And if exoterrestrials ever find this box, um, you know, as a result of, for example, New Horizons coll colliding with an exoplanet and burning up in the atmosphere, and then they find this box in the on the on the ocean floor in their exoplanet. Uh, that would be very uh, uh, disturbing because they would say, um, "What is this primitive ritual of the so-called humans who burn?" all the genetic information about a person that they want to commemorate. These ashes are no different than the ashes of a cigarette. So frankly, I'm, I'm quite ashamed that uh, we sent out <laughs> uh, burnt up DNA of a person we want to commemorate. Because anyone that finds it would say, we don't want any business with humanity. They were not very intelligent. They were quite aggressive in this primitive ritual. Anyway, coming back to uh, those unidentified aerial phenomena, the uh, second branch of the Galileo project has to do with identifying the unidentified. And we have a suite of instruments that we are now testing that uh, we put together. It costs about $250,000 just for this suite of instruments. And uh, hopefully within a month or two, it, uh, we will get all the data that we need uh, and start analyzing it with artificial intelligence systems. And, and then once the system works to our satisfaction, uh, we will deploy it at a desired location and basically take a, a video of the sky in the infrared, in the optical, in the radio, and in audio. So that's another aspect of the Galileo project, other than the expedition to Papua New Guinea and the design of a space mission to date the next Oumuamua. And at first we put this system on the roof of the Harvard College Observatory, but now we moved it to another location. Um, so let me make some general comments before closing. Um, one of the most fundamental question we have about the universe is what makes most of the matter in it. We call it dark matter. Fritz Zwicky discovered it back in 1933. And for 40 years, the, the concept was ridiculed because this is not what makes the solar system. When we look inside the solar system, we see ordinary matter. But then it turns out that's only a fifth of the matter in the universe. There is 80% that is something else. And it doesn't interact with light. It's not the matter that we see in the solar system. So very often people quote Carl Sagan as saying back in the 1970s, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. My point is extraordinary evidence requires extraordinary funding. Because to find the nature of the dark matter, for example, with the Large Hadron Collider, uh, the most popular idea was that maybe the dark matter is made of the lightest supersymmetric particles. So we invested $10 billion in the Large Hadron Collider to search for the lightest supersymmetric particles. And guess what? We didn't find any. So in the natural range of parameters where everyone said it must be there, there wasn't any supersymmetry. There wasn't any particle that makes the dark matter. $10 billion, okay? So nobody said beforehand, talking about supersymmetric particles as the nature of dark matter 
is an extraordinary claim. There is no extraordinary evidence. Therefore, forget about it. Let's move on. No, people said, okay, well, that's an idea we should check. We put $10 billion, we didn't find anything. Okay, well, that's part of science. So if we just invest 1% of the $10 billion to search for technological equipment from other civilizations, the way the Galileo project is pursuing, we would get very clear results on objects like Oumuamua, just for $100 million. Why aren't we doing that? Of course, there are other ways to look for extraterrestrial civilizations. One can look for industrial pollution in the atmospheres of exoplanets or city lights on the night side of exoplanets. I wrote papers on both. And one has to keep in mind uh, that there is a tension between the ability of a civilization to send equipment to space and its ability to destroy itself, either through a nuclear war or climate change. And it's possible that the answer to Fermi's paradox, if we, you are trying to find other civilizations by searching for radio signals, the way SETI was conducted for 70 years, it's possible that all of them are dead by now, all of those that transmitted radio signals, either dead or they moved on to other technologies. But there is a better way to search, which is for objects. And they could appear either as space trash, which means uh, equipment that is defunct, like New Horizons or Voyager would be in a billion years from now. Or they could still be functional, like AI astronauts. Now, we don't have a protocol for how to engage with a visitor. Uh, uh, we don't have any organization that represents Earth. And we would have to respond quickly if we find an object that is functional in our vicinity, because it will be just like finding a visitor in your backyard. You have to respond to that. My hope is um, that finding relics of a more advanced civilization would inspire us uh, because if you look at human history, you know, very often what you find is a group of people trying to feel superior relative to other people. That's, that's the source of all evil on earth. Uh, and perhaps, you know, if we find evidence for a smarter kid on our cosmic blog, it would basically imply that the differences between us humans are not so significant. And maybe then we would treat each other as equal members of the human species. So that's my hope. But the most important thing is to maintain humility because this cosmic play is not about us. We arrived late. And what we need to do is find other actors that may have a better idea about what the play is about. Thank you. I'll be glad to answer any questions. Okay, let's have questions, folks. I got a question, Professor. Um, you can call I, me Avi, by the way. Oh, Avi, and it's an honor to speak to you. Um, I, I guess on these. Uh, beings or whatever must have traveled billions of years because to my knowledge uh and i'm not into the science thing uh you can't go faster than the speed of light laws of physics break down and second this is kind of an off the wall question you know your book and all that brings out the people uh, talking about roswell and all uh and, and each no, my book does not talk about roswell no and not I your book but other people reading it might think oh well yeah we're right all along that uh it's possible. <laughs> I mean, is, is there a chance the government's doing any cover-ups on anything? Okay. For, to answer your first question, I didn't speak about moving faster than light. I don't conceive that. I'm a physicist, and there is no evidence that it's possible to move faster than light. Okay, so I'm not advocating that. 
I was saying that if you just use chemical propulsion, which is the method we've used since Sputnik, okay? And the chemical propulsion is based on the rocket equation. So basically you throw gas backwards. This is the burnt fuel, the gases of the, just like a jet plane is being propelled, but you have to carry the fuel with you. Okay, the rocket has to carry the fuel. As a result, the mass of fuel that you need to carry grows exponentially with the terminal speed of the rocket. So you can't go above 10 times the exhaust speed, the, the speed by which the gas leaves the exhaust. And that means that these speeds, the sound speed of exhaust gases is about a few kilometers per second. And that limits all rockets to about 30 kilometers per second, factor of 10 bigger. That's why all the space missions since Sputnik until New Horizons are all tens of kilometers per second speed, okay? So at that speed, very limited speed, first of all, it's a complete coincidence that this speed is just what you need to escape from the solar system because that's the speed of the earth around the sun. And if you take advantage of the motion of the earth around the sun, and then you add to that the 30 kilometers per second from, a, from the rocket uh, effect, you end up with a speed that exceeds the escape speed from the vicinity of the sun, okay? And it's com a complete coincidence that the rocket that we can manufacture using chemical propulsion allow us to escape from the gravitational potential well of the sun at the habitable zone where we live, okay? So now you say, okay, well, it's 30 kilometers per second. That's a very low speed. It's 10 to the minus four of the speed of light, a percent of a percent of the speed of light. I'm not talking about moving faster than light. I'm talking about moving at 10 to the minus oh, okay. four of the speed of light. At that speed, it takes half a billion years to traverse the entire disk of the Milky Way galaxy from one end to another. Uh, the, the, the sun is about 24,000 light years from the center of the Milky Way. So just to cross that distance twice takes half a billion years. Half a billion years is much less than the age of the Milky Way galaxy by at least a factor of 20, okay? <clears throat> so that means that, and we know that most of the stars from billions of years before the sun. So that means that if there was another star where the clock was started a billion years before us, then it's a piece of cake. There was half a billion years to just go everywhere. And then you have a spare half a billion years to, to create, for example, self-replicating probes that will increase the population of probes exponentially. So what I'm trying to say is that the difference in ages between the sun and most of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy is sufficiently long such that if the clock, the technological clock started ticking at the same time as for the sun in other stars, there was enough time for these probes to fill up the entire Milky Way galaxy, okay? Oh. With chemical propulsion, no speed of light. I'm talking about a factor of 10,000 slower than the speed of light. I don't need the speed of light. Speed of light is not good because anything you send at the speed of light will escape from the Milky Way galaxy. If you send it at 30 kilometers per second at 10,000 times slower, it will remain bound to the Milky Way galaxy. And it can basically just move back and forth and fill up all the habitable zones around all the stars in one billion years, self-replicate like crazy and fill up the entire Milky Way galaxy. Thank you. Uh, thank you very now, much. with respect to your second question, I don't think the, the US government is competent enough uh, <laughs> to hide a secret of that nature. Uh, when I met with um, the director of this, the new office in government, he told me that he has access to everything, basically both the intelligence and the, um, the Department of Defense. And, uh, and he also has a budget because he was allocated money by the Congress and he will be looking into it. Now, he obviously, if he finds something of interest, the first person to know will be the President of the United States. And um, 
Uh, that doesn't make much sense to me, by the way. If you find evidence for an extraterrestrial technological civilization and you tell President Biden, it's just like going to President Biden and telling him that he is the only person to know that the universe is made mostly of hydrogen, that hydrogen is the most abundant element in the universe. This is not a matter of national security. This is some knowledge about the universe that should not be the privilege of the president of the United States. It should be the knowledge of everyone on earth. <laughs> so just going to the president is not making much sense to me, but uh, I think the government is not hiding anything. I think that a lot, a lot of the unidentified objects in the past were a mixed bag. They were either people, amateurs, uh, not really recognizing that they are looking at the drone or a military piece of equipment, or the government tra trying to hide some new technologies they just developed and some people saw them. Or even some parts of the military is not aware of what other parts are, be are developing and seeing some new technologies and thinking it's you know unidentified. But it's hard for me to imagine that the government would hide based on what I know. Now, of course, it, it's possible that I, I don't know something, but um, that this is my take on it. Thank you very much. You clear, yeah, answer very well. Thank you. Um, I, I had a question about um, what you've been calling the local standard of rest. Oh, go ahead, yes. You use, the metaphor you used sort of implied it's like plunking a boy in the water and just sort of hanging out and what's what the waves bring by. What's that for? What's what gets oh, with that? <laughs> That's an excellent question. So in my book, I refer to that. And one possibility, okay, so I thought of uh, a few possibilities. One is that you have an array of such things and they are serving as... Uh, road signs if for navigation through interstellar space. So they are positioned uh, in the local standard of rest in many places. And then if you, you, are, you, have a, you embark on an interstellar trip, use them uh, to triangulate your position, okay, like an array. Uh, another possibility that I could think of is that um, it's, uh, it requires the minimum amount of, if you suppose you want to, uh, examine the habitable region around the sun. Uh, one way to do that is to send uh, a spacecraft that will go towards the sun. But another one is just to place your spacecraft or, or probe, let's call it a probe, to place your probe in the direction that the sun is moving such that it will get to the inner part of the solar system without any propulsion. It just sits in the local standard of rest and positions itself along the path of the sun such that it will end up very close you know within the habitable zone and that is the minimum amount of energy that you need to invest instead of aiming at another star you just place yourself along its path and so that's another possibility right so if we walk along a beach and we find this odd shaped object uh like a cell phone should we or should we not push the buttons Okay, so I got an email from someone who said, please, please, I ask you, if you do go to <laughs> near Papua New Guinea and you find a gadget on the ocean floor, please do not press any button because it would affect all of us. That's what he said. And I said, don't worry about it. I already uh, spoke with a curator of the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. And I promised her that um, I will put it on exhibit there. <laughs> I will not press any button because for us, it will represent modernity or whoever sent it, it represents ancient history. <laughs> well, I mean, how much in common would we have with these civilizations that you know, are capable of making these devices? Oh, I think we have very little in common because, okay. There are two, uh, I mean, we developed our science and technology just for a century, more or less. You know, quantum mechanics, you know, it's just a century ago. Uh, so all the gadgets that we are now using are based on quantum mechanics. Uh, science, modern science and technology is a century old. And that is one part in a hundred million yeah. of the age of the sun, okay? So, or, or the age of the Milky Way or the age of the universe. Uh, so it's a, 
it's very unlikely that if there is another star that is offset in in, in the timing uh, from us by a billion years, let's say, that any civilization developing on it would be exactly at our century, exactly at the same technological phase as we are. Most likely, they would either be much behind us, just like we were a million years ago, you know, and uh, or they would be much more advanced than we are, let's say a million years from now. Uh, and if they are a million years back, you know, it, we need to build a spacecraft, land on their exoplanet, and start searching through the bushes, you know, the trees, to find these chimpanzee-like animals that are a little more sentient, you know, like that would be a huge amount of work. Sure. I don't want us to get engaged in that. Uh, but if they are much more advanced than we are, then uh, we don't need to do much because they may be visiting us. And in that case, there would be a huge technological gap between us and them. And, uh, you know, if we find any gadget, it might look like magic to us, what it can do. But the first thing, you know, the way to find it is to see that it's not familiar, that it's not a rock, it's not natural in origin, and it's not human-made in origin. That's the way we can tell that it's unusual. But understanding it or reverse engineering it could take a long time for us. It's just like asking a, a cave dweller, you know, that goes to New York City. Imagine a cave dweller going to New York City and seeing everything, all the lights, all the gadgets there. You know, the, the cave dweller will be at O, will come back to their family and say, um, you know, that's amazing, but he would never be able to reverse engineer what uh, was experienced, you know. Uh, Avi, do you think that those folks are uh, already one amongst us or that the, the, the DNA is already part of us? That's a very interesting question. There is a colleague of mine uh, at the Harvard uh, uh, Medical School, uh, MGH, uh, named uh, Rufkun, Rufkun, Gary Rufkun. Uh, he's quite accomplished and he thinks that maybe the human DNA contains evidence for panspermia. That's a transfer of, um, you know, like seeding uh, planets with life. And it can be in principle done artificially, you know, like, uh, it, you know, that's a possibility. Although most of the community that works on the origin of life thinks that it happened out of the soup of chemicals here on earth by chance. Uh, and they think it's quite possible. Uh, uh, by now after you know so maybe eventually once we once we produce life in our laboratories we could demonstrate it but um, at the moment it's an open question and it's possible you know uh, it's also possible that um, it was not directed panspermia artificially planted uh, here on earth but it was just rocks that came from mars that life started on mars and we are all martians in the sense that it started on Mars and then came to Earth. By the way, there, there is something really peculiar that I noticed um, a couple of weeks ago is uh, Mars lost its um, atmosphere and uh, all the liquid water on the surface of Mars evaporated two and a half billion years ago. Uh, th th there is a lot of evidence indicating the timing. It's about two to two and a half billion years ago. And Earth, did not have much oxygen in the atmosphere until two and a half billion years ago. Ever. Why is there this coincidence? I just noticed it. I don't think anyone looked into that. Thank you. Doctor, this is, uh, this is Rich Sherman. I, I, I don't know if you can hear me, but I, I read your book and I enjoyed it a great deal. And I appreciate your courage um, to write a book that turns out to be fairly controversial among your colleagues. But the thing that stood out with, to me in your writing was something really very powerful was about kind of the zero sum nature of research, especially as it relates to the type of work you're doing, that if your project gets funded, that means someone else's does it and, and your colleagues or competitors, if you will, come after you because they feel like they're competing for budget dollars. 
And so there's a lot of speculation about extraterrestrial life and people get all excited talking about it. I'm more interested in talking about this part of your book about, you know, if you don't look for something, you'll never find it. And we have to stop this paradigm of attacking one, one another as I completely agree. communities. I completely um, agree. I completely agree. But I wanted to emphasize that science is not a zero sum game. That's one of the essays that I wrote for Scientific American. Science is an infinite sum game in the sense that we all benefit from discoveries. And they, you know, we have an unlimited uh, horizon of um, uh, knowledge that we can all work towards. And so we all benefit and it's an infinite sum game. So yeah. and, and the, the other thing is... Um, the activities, the, the project, the Galileo project that I have, the money that I have in my research account at Harvard, it's all coming from the private sectors uh, sector. Uh, there were people that individual donors that came to me and they would not allocate their money to science otherwise. OK, so they were inspired by this subject specifically. It's really <laughs> ironic because, um, for example, the director of the Center for Astrophysics, um, she uh, she just started a month a couple of months ago uh, here at Harvard and uh, first thing was uh, she asked me uh, is it possible to invite your donors to a special event now what she did not understand is my donors are not my donor you know it's not as if they are willing to fund astronomy in any way and form and including the next generation telescope or something like that. They were inspired by this specific subject. Okay, so that, so in a way, you know, I'm not taking any money from anyone else, right. and um, and all of my over the past decade, this is not just the Galileo project, but all of all of my funding over the past decade came from either private donors or foundations. I did not write a single NSF or NASA proposal to fund my research, and uh, first of all. Uh, there is a much bigger world out there. Second of all, the selection committee, the committees that allocate funds under the federal agencies, they are, you know, full of uh, mainstream people that uh, basically are not willing to take any risks. Okay. And why are they not taking risks? The argument is we don't want to spend to waste taxpayers' money. Now, guess what? If you were to poll the, the taxpayers and ask them, do you want to know whether the dark matter is made of weakly interacting massive particles or, uh, or the lightest supersymmetric particle? Or do you want to know whether there is technological equipment in space? They would favor the latter, but the former has all the funding and the latter has zero funding from federal agencies. So you ask yourself, okay, how can this argument hold water? where people say we don't want to waste taxpayers' money when the taxpayers are saying they want to study this subject. So there is a complete mismatch between academia and what the public cares about, okay? And now the government also cares about it because there is a new office in government. The Congress allocated a lot of funding to that office. And I say, you know, how can, the, how can academia distance itself from the interest of the public and at the same time claim that they want not to take risk in order not to waste tax. Like you have a whole community of theoretical physicists working on string theory. It's very popular in Princeton, New Jersey. Okay. And that's the shrine of string theory. And I ask you, what have we accomplished in 40 years of string theory? There is not even a single prediction that is testable. There is not even a single theory. There is multiple possibilities and you know, is that really what the public wants to, to figure out over the past 40 years? And at the same time, the subject that is of, of great interest to everyone is not being funded and is not popular and is ridiculed. Yeah, I, I'm just so, so glad you had a chance to talk about that because I really wanted to hear you speak more about that as you highlighted in your book. So thank you very much. That's, that's a really compelling argument. Thank you. And by the way, I just wanted to say that at a young age, I served in the military. I was born in Israel and it's obligatory. And the one thing that when I was in the first few months in the paratroopers, the one thing that was often said is that sometimes a soldier needs to put his body on the barbed wire so that others can pass through. 
And the way I see my, my role is just that. And so that the next generation will be able to work on this subject without any uh, prejudice blocking it. Thank you. Professor, I have a quick question. Go so, ahead. yeah, you have um, spoken a lot in this presentation about human ego, humility, and then from that, maybe, you know, um, pollution, nuclear war. So, I know you are a scientist, not a political person, but um, have you taken any project or action uh, to make more awareness of that, you know, how big is our ego and to protect art? Uh, any part that action yeah so i um well first of all uh, i had about um, uh, 1700 interviews over the past year and a half since my book came out and i always speak about that so i'm advocating in podcasts in interviews but um, moreover i have a regular blog on medium uh, it's not blog it's actually essays and uh, you might want to check it out and every couple of days a few days i write something and it's all in this spirit. So I'm trying to uh, advocate as much as I can. I'm still, the, you know, I was chair of the astronomy department at Harvard for nine years between 2011 and 2020. So when the pandemic started, that was exactly the end of my um, three terms, the longest serving chair. And, uh, and uh, uh, I'm still the director of the Institute for Theory and Computation. So in my leadership positions, you know, I'm trying to advocate for that. And my students and postdocs know about it. Um, and, you know, it's really the young people that I worry about because they are afraid. They, they are still vulnerable in terms of seeking jobs. They, they need the, to appease the senior people. And if the senior people are attacking me for just deviating from the beaten path, it sends a very strong message to the young people not to do that. OK, and innovation usually comes from the young generation. So I see that as doing a lot of harm to innovation. If the young people are supposed to all, uh, you know, abide by exactly what, you know, the box being within the box means. And, and if the box is not in the right place, then, you know, uh, uh, what what is correct to do is out considered outside the box, which is very unfortunate. Uh, then you can never correct the course of the mainstream. So, I mean, just to give you an example with respect to Oumuamua, uh, I was at a colloquium at Harvard and we left the auditorium with a colleague of mine in, who worked on rocks for decades. And he said, Oumuamua is so weird, I wish it never existed. And what does this statement mean? It means that an expert on rocks prefers only to see rocks in the sky. So when there is something that deviates from the rocks that we have known, it's a pro it bothers that person. Whereas in reality, that person should be excited and saying, oh, wow, that's unusual. Let's figure out what this thing is. Maybe we learn something new. That's the approach of a kid learning about. And somehow this innocence of trying to figure out things the way kids are is, was lost. And, and people in academia are mostly uh, chasing their ego by trying to get honors, awards. That bothers me. And um, social media is actually a very, um, has a very negative impact because it's, it, it, it basically promotes the herd, the group thing, the herd the mentality. And so I'm, I'm worried about these trends. I'm trying as much as I can to correct them. Uh, and it's not easy. Thank you, Professor. I appreciate it. Hi, we have a question. Um, if you reverse the paradigm and if the aliens were to encounter Voyager 1 or 2 probes <laughs> that have been sent, uh, what would be their reaction and would they think it came from a caveman? I think, yeah, these, these vehicles represent early stages in our technological development and uh, the trademark of a more advanced phase in our future would be to um, not just send the physical things, but allow these things to think, you know, to have artificial intelligence. So we already have artificial intelligence driving cars and, you know, within a few years, it may uh, uh, replace our doctors. And, uh, but uh, there would be a stage where, we, where uh, sentience will be accomplished. And at that point, you know, we will send AI astronauts because they are much better equipped to survive in space for long periods of time, 
you know, a, a, any trip with uh, chemical propulsion takes millions of years to, to go even to the nearest stars. And uh, equipment will have no problem with being patient, with surviving the harsh environment of space without needing nutrients, uh, uh, without, you know, perhaps with a 3D printer, they, they would be able to repair themselves. So that's the next phase of space exploration. It will not be limited to just dumb pieces of equipment the way we, I mean, Perseverance is a robot, but it's being operated by people at JPL, Jet Propulsion Lab. So we really never sent uh, an intelligent piece of equipment to space. And that will be the next phase. So if they see Voyager or New Horizons, it's really reflecting on, our, on, on the early primitive phases of our development. I mean, they would say at least they sent something, you know, that's nice, yeah. but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but that's something cannot think, you know, they would say, oh, it's very dumb. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, hi, Avi. Hi. C can you hear me? It's Jim Peck. Yes. Um, these objects, if, if they do exist and they've been sent out by other civilizations, are they actually aimed at habitable zones or are they just randomly flying around? The Milky Way. Uh, that's that's an excellent question, and I'll tell you why it's so important. Because um, if objects are aimed at the habitable zone, then uh, the volume of the habitable zone is ten to the minus sixteen uh, of the volume of interstellar space associated with the sun. So every star, you know, you can imagine each star having a volume in interstellar space. So, you know, and these volumes are touching each other like billiard balls. And the habitable zone is a tiny region that is one part in a hundred thousand or so, uh, because it's one astronomical unit relative to the size of the solar system, which is a hundred thousand astronomical units. So out to the edge of the Oort cloud. So altogether, if they are aimed at the habitable zone, there would be 10 to the minus 16 of them. Mm -hmm. Uh, given the detection rate near Earth. So if we detect one object, let's say per decade or per few years, that translates to an abundance that is 10 to the 16 times bigger if they were on random or orbits versus if they were targeting the habitable regions. So that's a huge factor. And it means that you can save a lot if you make these probes uh, targeted. And uh, if you assume that Oumuamua was not targeted, that it was part of a random population, then you need uh, more material than uh, exists right now in the solar system. So in fact, interstellar objects need, uh, they dominate over bound objects at the edge of the solar system. They, there are more of them than uh, Oort cloud objects. And moreover, the meteors that uh, we discovered, the interstellar meteors, they carry about 40% of all the refractive elements uh, in the interstellar meteors. So that would mean that somehow, you know, you, you need a process that converts a substantial fraction of the refractive elements into interstellar objects. And planetary systems cannot do that. And so it needs to be maybe an ex exploding stars, maybe supernova. But what I'm saying is the mass budget is really demanding if you assume random orbits, but then you cut it down by a factor of 10 to the power 16 if they're targeted. Uh, thank you. Just a quick follow-up is what would be any advantage to these civilizations sending these probes out if the likelihood of ever getting any kind of an answer is probably zero? No, it's not, okay. It's not so much about uh, them learning what we have accomplished. It's more about um, them arriving at a habitable planet because there is liquid water and there is there are nutrients there that they can use to self-replicate, for example, these probes, uh, or uh, in order to plant the seeds for something that they care about, okay? So it's just a matter of you have some principles that you care about and you want to spread them as much as possible. You know, just like dandelion seeds, uh, you know, carried by the wind, and you want them to reach places so that there would be more of the same. Okay, so that would be my guess. Oh, yeah, I, I have uh, two questions that came from chat that I think kind of um, dovetail with each other. 
Uh, one of them, uh, how is breakthrough listening being organized? Are there any other sensing or observations in addition to the radio telescopes they are using? And then I think it kind of dovetailed. Has the web telescope been able to track the location of any extra uh, solar system object? I don't know if that. No, no, the web telescope just started a few months ago and um, we did not detect as of yet an interstellar object. And it will not be a good tool for detecting it because it has a very small field of view of five arc minutes or so. Right. So it looks at a small portion of the sky. So we need to find those objects with the Vera Rubin Observatory and then direct the web telescope to look at them. Um, but um, let's see, your first question was about breakthrough listen and uh, that is focused on looking for radio signals or laser signals, um, uh, nothing to do with objects. That's what okay. breakthrough listen is about. Okay. Yeah. Um, I need to uh, leave at nine, which is pretty much now. Uh, I have another commitment. Um, I'm really grateful for all the questions, and it was really a pleasure to speak with all of you. We will remember this for a long time, and we're all going to keep an eye on what your group and the project is doing. Thank you so much for sharing the night with us. Thank you. Thank you, and it's a great pleasure. And my in my next visit to Princeton, I'd be glad to, to see you. Oh, let's do it. Great. Wow, Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Fantastic. Okay. okay. Best of luck. Best of Goodbye. luck. Yeah. Forward. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Watch the skies, guys. Good night. Yep. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.